Are we slaves to the workings of the brain? Are we merely determined to dance to our DNA? For years, many scientists thought we were determined and completely created by our DNA and brain biology. However, a new field of research is challenging these established beliefs that we are nothing but biological robots. The field of quantum biology has begun, and some researchers have been arguing for more than a decade now that quantum biology gives us a more complete description of ourselves. To start, quantum biology is the field that applies quantum mechanics to biological systems in order to explain how they operate, where classical biology cannot give a full account. For example, quantum mechanics has been shown to play a role in photosynthesis and how birds migrate, as well as how our sense of smell works. Quantum entanglement has been shown to hold together DNA, the code of life itself. And within DNA, there is evidence that quantum jitters, random instantaneous changes, could be causing genetic changes and be a driving force for evolution. Duke researchers have found what they call quantum jitters in the shapes of DNA bases that may account for the spontaneous mutations driving both evolution and disease. It was once believed quantum mechanics played no role in macro objects, let alone biological structures, because the environment was too hazardous for quantum processes. Yet this research alone refutes this claim. It is now known biological systems can and do take advantage of quantum processes and can use them for beneficial means. But can this be applied to the brain? Can aspects of quantum biology better explain how the brain works and how the mind or soul is able to work with the brain? Since quantum processes exist and are used in biological systems, there is no reason at face value to assume they could not work in the brain. On top of this, there is actually new research on the study of quantum mind theory which can better explain how the brain works and is more compatible with our intuition and how we assume the brain works. In reality, Quantum mind theory is really a collection of different theories. However, they all argue aspects of quantum mechanics, like superpositions and entanglement, play an intricate part in the brain and how we process information and make decisions. Most of the theories revolve around the basic premise that deep inside neurons, there are tiny structures called microtubules, which are made of proteins called tubulins. Since tubulins are proteins, they contain amino acids called tryptophan. On a molecular level, Tryptophan at its end is made up of six carbons bound together in a form of a ring. This ring consists of electrons that oscillate from side to side of the ring. Because of the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics, the actual location of these electrons is more properly described by a wave function, or in other words, as a cloud of possible locations. Because these tryptophan molecules are close to each other, one tryptophan ring can share an electron cloud with another tryptophan ring, and so on and so on. Sharing of the electron clouds causes the displacement of the tryptophan into a superposition of two states. So due to the molecular makeup of tubulins, they can exist in a superposition of two states at the same time, which we'll represent as a 1 and a 0. Now being in a superposition, it would exist as both the state of a 1 and a 0, which would be known as a qubit, until it collapses to one state or the other. Now since tubulins make up microtubules, the sharing of the superposition along an electron cloud can exist along several different pathways, which is known as a topological qubit. Thus, through the different possibilities of just one microtubule, different pathways could exist in a superposition, and this results in large-scale coherence among thousands of tryptophan molecules on any given microtubule. The two requirements for quantum computation are superpositions of two states, which allows molecules to represent qubits. We have seen how this could occur in just one tryptophan molecule which when displaced, exists as a superposition of a 1 and a 0 state. The second requirement is large-scale coherence. Again, we have seen how this occurs among thousands of tryptophan molecules at the same time. And because microtubules are so close to each other in the human brain, large-scale quantum coherence could be shared between thousands of microtubules. Thus, microtubules inside neurons fulfill the two requirements necessary for quantum computation. I know this is a little complex, but what this would mean is the brain could compute different possibilities simultaneously until a decision is made and the collapse to one state is produced, which corresponds to the intuitive way of how we think, of weighing different options before making a final decision. Second, this would also mean the information of the brain would be held together through quantum entanglement and could process and transfer information across the brain instantly. When these quantum mind theories first came out, some claim that the brain is too large and wet for quantum coherence. What this means is the brain contains a lot of water, and the random motion of water seems to destroy quantum coherence and produces decoherence, and thus it is claimed the brain is too wet for quantum computation to occur. But these objections are invalid for three reasons. 
First, the objection is based on a mathematical miscalculation, assuming the superposition needed to be much larger than what quantum mind models predicted. And since the superposition would be much smaller, there would be less of a chance for something to interfere. Second, the tryptophan molecules, which were proposed to be involved in quantum coherence, exist in areas of microtubules, which are hydrophobic, that is, areas which would exclude water and would protect against interference. So the water molecules could not enter into these areas and interfere with coherence. Lastly, this objection is directly challenged by the fact that quantum coherence does seem to play a role in biological organisms, as discussed earlier, and more are being discovered. These biological organisms contain as much water as the human brain, and that doesn't seem to preclude quantum coherence from taking place. But is there any actual evidence quantum effects are taking place inside the human brain? In fact, there is. Predictions of quantum mind theory have been confirmed. Information processing has been reported to exist in microtubules, and we have experimental evidence of large-scale quantum vibrations coming from microtubules. In 2011, evidence of topological qubits was reported to exist inside microtubules, and the same researcher recently pointed out the microtubule appears to be a fundamental information processing device in biology. Thus, if we can piece this all together, it appears we have excellent experimental evidence the brain is quantum computing. If topological qubits appear to exist in microtubules, there is information processing inside microtubules, and there is evidence of large-scale quantum vibrations, then we have cumulative evidence for quantum mind theory. But what does this have to do with the evidence for the mind not being created by the brain? Actually, quite an important part. If the brain emerges from quantum computing, and the same quantum rules and effects apply, and the implications of the measurement problem apply to the brain as well. If the brain has several different pathways along its microtubules and a quantum superposition, then we must ask what is causing measurement and final collapse. The implications we see in quantum experiments would carry over to quantum biology. The wave function of the material brain is collapsed by the mind, or the observer. In other words, the mind measures the brain and produces real effects carried out in the brain. Thus, the brain would obtain in its very fabric the need for an observer to cause collapse. Plus, the idealist implications of matter in the observer carry over to what we discussed in the previous videos. Plus, this experimental data correlates to exactly what we see in the neuroscientific research on mindful attention and the plasticity of the brain. The mind is able to produce real observable effects in the brain. On top of that, this has even been shown to produce effects and changes in the body, giving new meaning to the term placebo effect. Studies on cancer patients show mindful attention can not only produce real measurable changes in the body, but also in our DNA. It appears we are not slaves to biology or our DNA, but active participants in the outcome. That obviously doesn't mean we have godlike control over ourselves, but the evidence still indicates we are participants and not totally determined by biology and genetics. The old notion we simply dance to our DNA has been experimentally challenged and found to be lacking. Therefore, the evidence demonstrates the mind is a real and active force, necessary to collapse the wave function of the brain and produce real changes. Quantum biology is still in its infancy stages, and more experiments are needed for more accurate conclusions, but the writing is on the wall, and the way we view ourselves will forever be changed. And if the quantum nature of reality is not only true about ourselves, but the world around us, a new picture of reality emerges, turning the old materialist notions on their head. We are not soulless zombies dancing to our DNA, but real and active beings, as we said before, the old Cartesian notion of the ghost in the machine may be dead, not because there is no ghost, but because there is no machine.